my daddy, the whole family, was held against their will. If you did leave, they either come get you or have somebody kill you, whatever, whatever. Jerry Dawson, he lived right in the same place we lived at home. He left, they went and got him, brought him back, carried him right down there from his house, killed him, hung him up in a tree, casterized him, and hung him up right from his house where his children, everybody could see him. I'm pretty sure it was 55, 56 when this happened. Most of us think that the end of the Civil War in 1865 closed the chapter on slavery in the American South, but that's far from the truth. Over the next 100 years, generations of black Southerners were forced to labor against their will. This new form of slavery happened in the shadows of the first half of the 20th century. And even though civil rights movement began advancing racial equality in the South in the 1950s, these practices continued secretly, making it a difficult history to prove. Today, there's one woman who's dedicated her life to finding this lost history of black identity. She's been called the slavery detective of the South. We're currently in Louisiana, about to meet Antoinette Harrell, who specializes in finding cases of essentially modern day slavery. We're really deep in the South right now. It's super swampy and super rural. I was actually born in Boston and moved to Atlanta, Georgia, like early on in my childhood, but I've never been out this far deep into Louisiana. I'm very interested in connecting with Antoinette and learning more about her work. Hi. Hello, Antoinette. Hi. Nice to meet you. Pleasure meeting you. Antoinette was born and raised in Louisiana, and even though she lost her leg to cancer a few years ago, that hasn't slowed her down from what she sees as a mission of justice, tracking down and verifying cases of slavery and abusive labor practices that happened after the Civil War. Sometimes she gets leads from newspaper clippings, old FBI reports, or recorded testimonies, and sometimes she just gets a phone call. I got scared because I seen how they beat some of the boys they beat people to death in there. Yeah. Mike, I appreciate you not taking this story to the grave with you. I know it hurt. I know it's very painful. And the state of Florida can't pay you all enough. But I'll be in touch with you shortly. A few of Antoinette's investigations have been used in court cases for reparations, though sometimes the end goal is simply to give people knowledge of their family roots, which for a lot of black Southerners is something that slavery erased. Let me first tell you how I got started with this. Researching my own family history. My family uh, was held as slaves. Well, in 1863, my family was emancipated. And my family did become sharecroppers. Robert Harrell became a sharecropper under the system of sharecropping. The planter and the newly freed former slaves came into an agreement. I will furnish you with the seeds, with the land, a place to stay. In return, you would give me a portion of the crops. Well, not everyone did the right thing. Although sharecropping was technically legal, the practice was widely abused by white landowners who used debts to keep African Americans tied to the land that they once worked as slaves. Sharecroppers didn't pay rent, but they didn't own any property. And today, historians agree, sharecropping was just slavery by a different name. So many former enslaved Africans had nothing. They had no choice. At the end of the year, you owe me. No matter how hard you work, you are told, sorry. And those cases relate directly to your cases today. Right. After slavery, these are like 1921, 1930, 1940s, the 50s, and some of them to the 60s. Antoinette's very first case was May Louise Miller, a woman who was held as a slave with her entire family in Mississippi until 1961. Though May passed away in 2014, Antoinette took us to see one of her brothers, Arthur Miller. May and Arthur being two of the older sisters and brothers, they remember a lot. It took a long time before Arthur really opened up and talked. We lived on 
I don't know what would you call it, but something like a plantation to me. It belonged to several different white people. They all were family, I guess, and you couldn't leave. And if you did leave, they either come get you or or have somebody kill you, whatever, whatever. That's what that, that's what happened. They did my mama bad. What they do to your mother? They just had my mother. You know, the white men. You know, they they, they just do what they want to do with them. And uh, I just wasn't big enough to do nothing. If I would have been, I don't know, probably wouldn't be. And this was in the 1950s or 40s? That was on through the 40s, in the 50s, all through the 50s, in part of the 60s. So what would the repercussions be if you tried to leave or if you tried to refuse what they wanted? Back in them days, it's, it's, it was kind of like you had to do what the white man said or i get killed. My dad is uncle. He made him dig a grave and killed him. <laughs> the what? They killed him and buried him in his own grave. Jerry Dawson, they killed him. He lived around the same place we lived at home. He left and said he wasn't coming back. They wouldn't got him. Bought him back, cut him right down there from his house. Killed him. Hung him up in a tree. They hung him? They killed him first. Casterized him and hung him up right from his house where his children, everybody could see him. Were you aware that this is 1940s, 1950s, that, <laughs> this is insane. Um, Arthur, this is, this is, this breaks my heart to hear this story. Um, growing up, did you, were you fully aware, this is in the 40s and 50s, you know, the civil rights movement is just about to begin. Were you aware of what was going on in the rest of the country at that time for black people? pursuing freedom? No. You, had, you weren't aware at all that this was, there was any pursuit for freedom in the 40s and 50s for us? No, not really. Not really, because I think maybe like in 65, 66, then they was doing that marching. You know, that's when I really found out. People are scared to talk about it. it it's, it's people right now y'all go to talk to. They won't talk with y'all about this year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're scared to do it. They got their fear in them, uh huh? How could something like this happen? A lot of these places that was in very isolated rural areas, it was easy. I mean, you had the opportunity to ride through some of these areas and you saw for miles and miles, there's absolutely nothing. You think, like, how could somebody not just escape these type of conditions? And once you actually are out here, you see there is nothing but cotton fields and crops and long strips of road where, where can you fathomably go? It's insane to see how you can be trapped on this land on so many different levels, whether it be economically, physically, and, and even mentally. We're calling on the world in terms of righteousness reparations. Antoinette's work for Arthur's family got the attention of a lawyer in 2001, and they became part of a class action lawsuit for reparations. But ultimately, the Supreme Court refused to hear the case, and the pursuit for reparations has since been dropped. How you doing, ma'am? My name is Antoinette Harrell, and I'm a historian. Hey, how y'all doing? I got a question, can I ask you something right quick? The lady in the next block told me there used to be a store where people used to share crop or work on somebody's land. Do anybody know that story? Is that how you do a lot of your work, just going out and talking to the community? Hey, how you doing? How you doing? A kid come with me. Yeah? Did you ever pick cotton? Oh yeah, I mean, it take me a whole day to get to one. One of Antoinette's new cases took us to the Ball Ground Plantation to meet a man named Donald Jeffrey. Donald comes from five generations of sharecroppers who worked the same land under the Simrel family. Donald still lives here, along with the last descendant of the Simrel family, a man named Karsten. Today, Donald works full time on another farm, but still lives rent free on this plantation and does odd jobs for Karsten. So their living situation is unconventional, to say the least. Why is Donald so nervous? Like, we're pretty uh, 
inconspicuous right now, because but wants I don't us in think, secrecy. I don't think he wants the boss man to see us here. Hey, Donald. Hey there, Donald. Nice How to you meet doing? you. Hey, good to see you. My mama's dad, and when they come along in their time, they will sharecropping. What kind of work was done on this plantation? Everything, fooling with cows, horses, and farming. What kind of work did your mother do on the plantation? She mostly did maiden work, did cooking. She told me at 14 years old, she started chopping cotton, and she would leave out the cotton field at a quarter, 20 minutes, 11, and cook a dinner to have it ready at 12. Why did you not leave the plantation? Because it was home to me. And I, you know, I love it here. It was a beautiful place. And I, you know, just didn't leave. You know, you're responsible for your light bill, but you don't pay no water bill or no rent. So, I mean, that's all. It works out. So what is your relationship to this plantation? Born and raised here, and Carson, I, he's almost like a brother to me. I mean, we have a, a real close relationship, a bond. So there's a brotherhood between you and Carson? Mm-hmm. Like family? Yeah, we are. That's right, we like family, sure is. We like brothers, I can go right there now and spend the night in his house. All the people that worked on this plantation, he refused to put them off. He would let them stay here. Yeah, right. And that's how you you end up staying. That's right, staying. Do I feel like he's holding back some things? Yes, I do. But he lives here, and he have to stay here when I'm gone. And I don't want to put anybody's life in jeopardy, you know, because this can happen. I mean, you know if you're talking about things that people don't want to be told. There's always someone that don't want you to talk about something. That night, I spoke with Karsten about his family's history on the plantation. Hey there, Karsten. Hey there, what y'all got going on? How's it going, man? Akil, hey nice there. to meet you. What nice you to meet you. Oh, oh, thanks for letting us, uh, you know, showing us around. Yeah, man. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, Come good on to see inside. You too. All right, great. Y'all want anything to eat or anything? Y'all want any beer? Coke, cola? It's fine, it's Seven fine. Up tea? Oh, it's fine, it's fine. If we could just do a little tour, that'd be amazing. And okay. just to talk a little bit about the history of right. uh, Ball Ground Plantation. This is yes. my wife, Natalie. Hi, nice to meet Welcome you. To Ball and then I would say the Semro family goes a, goes a long way out here, right? Yes. My family bought this place in 1899. So if I'm, see, five, I'm the fifth generation. What is your relationship with Donald? I don't even remember meeting him. Honest to God, we were childhood friends. No joke. I promise to God. Are you related to this man right here? Yes, that is my great, great, great grandfather. And what, what time period is this? Ooh, that would probably be in the 30s. This, this man right here was related to Donald, correct? That's Eli. Well, what kind of work was he doing at that time? Was he just like a general? Helper for your great grandfather? Just, just anything. He, he just do anything. And if anybody fooled with him, they had a hell to pay. That's awesome. Is he still with just us? Just like nobody fooled with Dom, so they know I will <laughs> kill him. Can you talk a little bit about the history of the land as well? Back then, it was very little open land. Okay, because every every home had their own little allotment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, say that you were living on my farm, okay? Mm -hmm. Rent free, okay? Mm -hmm. Seriously. Honest to God. I mean, who, who wouldn't do that? Mm -hmm. Shit. I mean, everybody else was charging their people. Right, so they just worked the crops and didn't have to pay rent on this land? Never, ever. Uh, that was like, because Donald was explaining a little bit about his, mm -hmm. his history and his experience and growing up Donald's here. sometimes full of shit. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> and was... you don't have to edit that either. <laughs> <laughs> so I see that there's some Confederate dollars here. Did your family have a lot of ties to the Confederate Army? Not really. Just no. had the currency? What misconceptions are there, do you feel, about no. the Confederate Army? Here it is right here. You can read it. The Southern Nation, the rise of the Old South. This, it says the South was right. It was written by two, two Kennedy brothers. This is about the South being right during the Civil War. I'm not trying to push the book, but it's proven. I mean, you can talk to anyone. We're 
We're in Vicksburg, Mississippi right now at the county courthouse where we're going to be looking at documents of Ball Ground Plantation where we met Donald and Carson yesterday. Antoinette wanted to see if she could find any information on Donald's family before they were sharecroppers for the Simrels. Since most African Americans have no information about their lineage from this time, it can be an important first step in grasping that part of our identity. We started with his last name, Jeffrey. So Antoinette is tracing the lineage of Donald, who has the last name Jeffries, because his former slave masters had the name Jeffrey. Just like my name is Gibbons, it's formerly the slaveholder that owned my, my family. Yeah. Oh, Jeffries. Mm -hmm. This it. is the estate. This is the personal property that he owned. So we want to hope that we find someone names in here. Okay, I need you to pull file 1101. Okay, come on, baby. You gotta be. Somebody talk to me. Finding records like this is rare when you think about how black families were systematically separated, sold off, and then trafficked across state lines. Even finding one person related to Donald would be a long shot. You found, you found something? I found, I, I, I'm not, I can't say that this is Donald's family, but there was one Negro woman and children for $850. Look at it for yourself. Oh, we have some names. John, $660. George, $650. Why is this important to me? Because when I'm doing Donald's genealogy, I will look for these names and see if his genealogy could connect me to one of these people. They had five mules, a plow, a sofa. In order to find anyone's family who was held as slaves, they have to look into the property uh, inventory. So this can be very painful mm -hmm. for people of African descent to do this. I'm looking at the expression on your face right now. <laughs> you know, yeah, this is, is this the first time you have seen the document like this? Yeah, but you know, you understand the realities of our yeah. history, but mm -hmm. to see it on a receipt listed, you know, from 1840s, I've never seen before. Yeah, yeah. Now that we had the names, Antoinette called another genealogist to run them through the National Archives. Jeffers, Jeffrey, Jeffy. You gotta look at all Jeffrey, of them. Jeffrey. We went through marriage licenses and found another relation named Belle Edwards. Here's the uh, and so I can license. order. Okay. I can order that file. We Edward have Griffith. Yeah. Belle Edwards. Okay, Bernice, I'm gonna take a picture of something and send it to you right quick. Okay. We're trying to give Donald some of his history as a gift. There you go, I just sent you something. So Antoinette, can you tell us what, what you just found? I just found Edward Griffin and Belle Edwards was married in 1877. So this is Donald's ancestors. She might have found something, hold on. Hello, Bernice. Which, what did you find? Isabella Edwards, they have the whole tree plus, they have pictures and everything. <gasps> I'm about to pass out. <laughs> Girl, don't oh tell me. Oh my goodness. And here it is, the Jeffrey tree. <laughs> Let me sit down. Let me, that's that's let me. crazy. Here I am looking at pictures. Wow, this is amazing. 89 people. Earl May Jeffrey, Maggie B. Jeffrey Reed, Hawkins. They even have the cemetery. Oh my God. I'm in tears. Oh I'm, in, I'm really actually in tears. I cannot believe. I cannot believe this. <sighs> Donald only knew. Antoinette was able to identify an entirely new branch of Donald's family. She found that his ancestors could be traced back to Virginia, one of the first and largest slave ports in America. It's now up to Donald to determine what he wants to do with this knowledge. It's hard to know how to accept any of our history in America, but at the very least, even learning who our ancestors from this time were feels like an act of justice. How do you feel about the work? You know, uh, Antoinette's visiting different places. I, I think that's nice. You know, that's good. You know, uh, uh, it, you know, y'all too, it's good what y'all doing. That's, 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 that's real good. It's good for somebody to know how people have been treated. After the Civil War, we were, as African Americans, promised 40 acres and a mule mm -hmm. to begin um, to have our own lives as Americans, mm -hmm. but we weren't able to get it. We weren't able to get it. You think that if we were given reparations that we may 
be able to fix what has been wrong? It may not re really fix it, but it would help. You know what I'm saying? It would, uh, <laughs> I do know what you're saying, yeah. You know, it, it, it's just something that's kind of unfixable. You can kind of admit it back together a little bit, but it, it won't completely fix certain things. Killing my uncle, you know, make him dig his grave, and you know, just stuff like that. You know, you don't, you just can't fix that there by giving me a mule. That's an entire piece of history that will be lost. We need to do as much recording with people who would talk about it. A lot of people went through it, but they're afraid to talk about it. It's bittersweet. It's bittersweet. The more you learn, the more I dig, the more I find. Sometimes things are a little hard to digest. So I just do it because it needs to be done.